Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, if you would like to grab your Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Sean is right. We're not just guests anymore. And I was reflecting on the difference between the first sermon that I preached here and today. And uh, I can just say that the, diff- the main difference is we just feel like family now. That first sermon, we were just showing up to Southside, and I was so nervous. Uh, but I'm just thankful to God that he has ministered so much in our lives in the time since then, and and you guys have meant so much to us. Um, But Romans chapter 6, we'll be reading the first 14 verses together this morning. So starting in verse 1, we read, this is the word of God. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body. To make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace." Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we come before you this morning and we are humbled by the privilege to sing about your character, to fellowship with other believers, and most of all, to hear the word of life in Scripture. I pray that it would land heavy on our hearts that the only reason that we can come today and reckon ourselves as children of God is because Christ has gone before us, dying the death that we deserved, and being raised to life, never to die again, and that he invites us through the gospel to die with him and to be raised as well. And God, we came this morning by the power of that new life to utter praise to you. And it's by that same power we hope now to hear and receive your word. I pray that every heart, including mine, would be receptive to the truth and the glory of what we just read. And that we would not just have a a glance encounter with the text, but we would walk away having been transformed, moved, changed by what we've seen, for your glory. And it's in Christ's name that we pray, amen. Uh, The year was 1888, and the man had just settled in to read the morning paper. He was scanning the pages absentmindedly when he 
was shocked to see a headline that announced his own death, followed by a lengthy obituary. As the man recovered from his initial surprise, he began to read what the reporter had to say about his life. And the contents were scathing. This man had become well known for inventing and manufacturing dynamite and other explosives, and the author of the obituary was intent on commemorating his violent legacy. Dismissing him as nothing more than a merchant of death, the reporter wrote that the man had spent his entire professional life profiting off of the pain of others. Now, sometime after this, almost certainly in response to reading his own premature obituary, the man decided to make some significant changes in his life. In fact, he adjusted his final will to redirect the better part of his fortune to the good of mankind. He bequeathed the modern equivalent of $265 million dollars to a fund to be used for awards and monetary prizes for those individuals whose work especially benefited humanity. And that man's name was Alfred Nobel. And to this day, annual awards are granted in his name for progress in the fields of physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, economics, and peace. Having once been eulogized as a merchant of death, Nobel would go on to cement his legacy as a promoter of the good. And as Christians, when we hear Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 14 read, it's like having our own spiritual obituary read out loud. As we listen to Paul describing the average believer as one who has died and been buried, we might feel shocked, we might even feel disturbed, as Alfred Nobel most certainly would have felt on that fateful day in 1888. Especially for those of you who don't regularly think of yourselves as dead in Christ, you might find this terminology jarring. But just as Nobel was spurred to action by the prospect of his own death, I believe that a firm knowledge of what it means to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ will result in a radical change in our thoughts and actions. And we come to that knowledge by following along with Paul's argument in our text today. Specifically, I want to draw your attention to three aspects of his argument. The first, in verse 1, is the question. The second, in verses 2 to 11, is the answer. And the third, in verses 12 to 14, is the implication. These are going to serve as our three points this morning. So we begin, in verse 1, with the question. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, it's impossible to understand why Paul would even ask such a strange question without a little bit of context. So if you're willing to follow along, I want you to look briefly at the second half of chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And what you'll see is that beginning in verse 12, Paul begins to make an extended comparison between two people, uh, those being Adam and Jesus Christ. Now, these figures share similarities. Both of them are what you would call corporate heads, which is just a fancy way of saying that both of them are representatives of races, of groups of people. Adam is the head of all sinners, and Jesus is the head of of all saints. And the reason that Paul makes this comparison is because he wants to show us, to demonstrate the superiority of the second Adam, which is Christ, over the first. This is why you'll hear Jesus referred to as the true and better Adam. 
Paul argues that through the disobedience of the first Adam, all of mankind was cast into depravity so that sin reigns over his race. But in contrast, through the obedience of the new Adam, Jesus Christ, the righteous representative who submitted to death and was raised to life, a new race began. And those born again into this new race are raised to walk in the newness of life. Now, we're going to come back to that imagery in just a little bit, but for now, it's important to understand what Paul's conclusion is. What is the bottom line that he draws from this long comparison between the first and the second Adam? Well, we find it in Romans chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, Grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. What a remarkable statement. What a beautiful truth. In contrast to the condemnation and the death that we inherit from Adam, Paul says that those in Christ have an inheritance of grace that covers their sins. And it doesn't just cover sin, it abounds. This is gratuitous grace, Paul says. This is exponential grace. If you can picture it in your mind, Jesus Christ is not scraping between the couch cushions trying to find just enough grace to cover your sins. He is not double counting his grace back to you in order to make sure that there is enough to cover the cost of your forgiveness. No, for every kiddie pool of sin, there is an ocean of grace in Christ's reserve. And this is an awesome reality. But as with every other awesome reality, we humans have the capacity to distort it into something ugly. And Paul knew this very well. As a matter of fact, I think that Paul would have made a really good chess player because whenever he stated a great truth, he always seemed to look two steps ahead to see how that truth could be misunderstood and misapplied. And the same is true here, which brings us to the question that we find in Romans 6.1. If God's grace is so great, and if he is so disposed to pour it out whenever we sin, why shouldn't we sin? It's like the old story goes. A pastor asked one of his members, brother, how's your relationship with God? The man said, there's not much to tell. I like sinning. God likes forgiving. We get along just fine. Now, of course, we hear that story and we might instinctively cringe at it, but let's consider just for a moment the logic of it. Wouldn't it be acceptable or even preferable to sin as much as we can so that we might get as much grace as possible, right? This is the reasoning behind Paul's question in verse 1. And he asks that because he knows that his critics are going to be asking that question. He knows that if he exalts the superabundant grace of God that he lavishes on us even as we sin, then he is going to be accused uh, of being an antinomian, a law hater, one who doesn't care about right and wrong or righteous behavior. So in that sense, he's answering the critic. But Paul is also highlighting the question because he knows that 
Christians are tempted to ask it too. In fact, we would do well to just put down all the pretenses this morning and be honest and admit that the question is not as far-fetched as it seems. All Christians, at one time or another, have been tempted to take advantage of God's grace. All Christians have been tempted to indulge in sin because we know that forgiveness is waiting on the other side. All Christians wrestle daily against indwelling sin. But if God is so gracious and if God is so forgiving, then should we keep wrestling? And if so, why? And to respond to these questions, we have to look at Paul's answer in verses 2 to 11. And that brings me to my second point, Paul's answer. And that answer comes in two parts. Paul responds first with an exclamation and then with an explanation. Look at verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So Paul's first answer to the question of whether or not Christians should continue in sin is this. May it never be. Now, in Greek, this phrase is uh, meganoito. I don't expect you to be familiar with it, but it does appear ten times in the book of Romans, and it is the most emphatic denunciation that Paul can give. It's actually really difficult to convey the gravity of the original phrase, which is why almost every English translation renders it a different way. But let me just give you one way to think about it. As all of you know by now, Carrie and I are the proud parents of three boys, two of which are old enough to get into some serious trouble. And as a result, we say no a lot in our house. It's like our favorite word. We use it all the time. It's like the first thing we say in the morning. It's like the last thing we say at night. In fact, I think sometimes that the boys have secured a private donor who will give them a dollar every time we say the word no. That's how much we say it. But if there's one thing I've learned as a parent, it's that, no, that every no is not created equal. Here's what I mean. I've got a no for the first time that Clay and Lincoln asked me something. And I've got a no for the hundredth time they asked me something, Right? I've got a no for when they get out of their seats during dinner, and I've got a no when a fork is about to go into a socket, right? There are levels to it. Urgency, gravity, danger, all that informs the force of my no. And Paul's may it never be in verse 2 is a fork in the socket kind of no. This is serious for Paul. In essence, he's saying, continue in sin that grace may abound? How inconceivable. How insane. May it never be possible that a professing Christian would actually live in this way or treat the grace of God in this manner. May it never be. So the principle is this. However we resolve the tension between God's superabundant grace on one hand and the Christian's responsibility to overcome sin, we cannot do it by minimizing the sinfulness of sin. Let me say that again. However we resolve the tension between God's superabundant grace and the Christian's responsibility to overcome sin, we cannot do it by minimizing the sinfulness of sin of sin. Or, more specifically, we must never use the grace of God as license for sin. 
as if his willingness to forgive us means that he somehow approves of our unrighteousness. But of course, after all that said, we're still left with the same question, which is this. Why not? Why not? Why not presume on grace? Why not take advantage? Why not bring the ocean of grace down on our heads? And for that answer, we'll have to look further at Paul's explanation in verses 2 to 11. Look with me, if you will, at Paul's response to his own objection in verses 2 and 3. So he, he raises the question, and then he says this, How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, even though these are posed as questions, these two sentences are crucial to the logic of the whole passage. They hold the argument together in some sense. So let's consider the first question. How can we who die to sin still live in it? So for Paul, the notion of sinning in order that grace may abound is absurd because it suggests that the receiver of God's grace is just free to continue living in sin. In other words, Paul is rejecting here the idea that our relationship to sin can be the same as it was before God lavished his grace upon us. As he understands it, grace has a profound, monumental effect on a person such that those who come in contact with it actually die to sin in some fundamental way. So who exactly has died to sin? Which group of people does this describe? And the answer to that comes in the way that Paul begins his second question in verse 2. He says, Do you not know that all of us, all of us, as a matter of fact, throughout the passage, probably 10 plus times, Paul uses we. So whoever Paul is talking about here, he's not speaking to the critic. He's not speaking to his opponent. He is speaking to the average believer. That's who has died to sin. Every believer, Paul says, has been baptized into Christ and has died to sin. And this is true of you this morning. If you're a believer, brothers and sisters, you have died to sin. Whatever you feel, However ashamed and burdened you are by sin this morning, you are dead to sin. You are buried with Christ. Your old man is gone, never to rise again, and yet you still live in Christ. In theological terms, this is called the doctrine of union with Christ, and it is unspeakably precious. In verses 4 to 11, Paul describes the manner in which we die to sin as a baptism. One in which our old self is crucified with Jesus and is buried, and our new self is raised to walk with him in the newness of life. And as a matter of fact, this is actually standard language for Paul. Consider what he says in Galatians 2, 19 and 20. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God, and I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And again, in Colossians 2, 12 and 13, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. So there's just a sampling of that imagery throughout Paul's letters. But it's important to understand that in these passages, especially in Romans 6, Paul is not talking about the physical act of baptism. As one commentator remarks, there is no water in Romans chapter 6. Rather, Paul is using the word as a metaphor. In fact, it's just like our articles of faith state. The physical act of baptism is meant to show forth in solemn and beautiful emblem our faith in the crucified, buried, and risen Savior with its effect in our death of sin and resurrection to a new life. So that's what baptism is. It's a sign, an outward, physical, visible, tangible sign of an inward spiritual reality. See, the word translated as baptism in our text, as every good Baptist should know, refers to immersion. Paul is using the imagery of baptism to show that we were fully immersed in the death of Christ and that we were raised with him as well. That's what we were watching not that long ago when we saw Quentin go down into the water and come back out. A picture of a spiritual reality, of dying and being raised. We are all in with him. We are bound with him in life and in death. And Paul summarizes this in verse 11 saying, So you, Christian, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So if you are a believer here this morning, then that means that at the moment of your conversion, God poured out his super abundant grace on you through Christ. And in that moment, you were not given permission to sin as much as you want from that point on, but rather in that moment, you were united to Christ. You were supplied with a new power, specifically the power of the Spirit of God who was at work in you. And in that moment, God reckoned your old self dead since Christ had already nailed the sins that were once against you to his cross. And in that moment, you became a new creature. Just as Christ was raised to life, never to die again, so too you were born again into resurrection life. And might I add this morning that if you're here under the sound of my voice or watching later and you have not been through this conversion, you are still dead in your trespasses and sins. But just as the Lord promised to his people in Ezekiel 36... You, believer, had your heart of stone removed. And God supplied you with a new heart, a flesh that was fit for righteousness. And from that moment on, your relationship to sin changed dramatically. And this is true even as we presently struggle against sin and temptation. And that brings me to my third point this morning, Paul's implication. Paul's implication. Listen to verses 12 to 14. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. 
Well, well, well. It would seem that Paul the liberal, who just a few verses ago was extolling the super abundant ocean-sized grace of God, has become Paul the uptight legalist. It's a shame. Maybe verses 12 to 14 sound to you like the same old moralism that you grew up with. Sit up straight. Dress right. Don't smoke. Don't cuss. Don't watch bad movies. Quit all that sinning. And if you act right, then maybe, just maybe, you'll earn yourself a spot on God's team. Maybe Paul just got carried away with all that grace talk. So now he's doubling back to sure up his credibility as a real hardline, no-nonsense kind of guy. But the good news is, I don't think that's what's happening at all. Because Paul, of all people, knows that you can't behave your way into heaven. In fact, Behaving like a Christian, quote unquote, apart from an internal and divine work of grace, has never been and will never be the means by which God accepts or justifies us. And that's why it's critical that we understand the relationship of verses 12 to 14 to one another and to the verses that come before and this is critically important this morning. I reworked this section to try to make it make sense, so please follow me. What I want you to see is that the force of Paul's argument is not found in verses 12 and 13. Now, I want to be clear. These verses are critically important. As Paul reflects on what it means to be dead to sin, he helps us by clarifying that it means we should not submit our members to sin. And it's crucial that we know that. That that's what it means to walk in obedience. But even though they come before verse 14, verses 12 and 13 actually only make sense in light of what verse 14 says. So here's an easy way to think about it. If you're following along in the passage, you'll see that near the beginning of verse 12, the word therefore is there. And if you'll notice, verse 14 begins with the word for. And here's what those two little words help us to see. Hear me this morning. Paul is not saying that we should flee from sin so that we can die to its power. Rather, he is saying, since we have died to sin, we can flee from its power. This is the implication of verses 12 to 14, believer. You are dead to Christ. And every imperative that comes your way, every do this and every don't do that, even in the context of the scripture, every imperative can only be obeyed because of an indicative, which is Christ has died for you and he has transformed you. In fact, here's how those verses would read in their logical order rather than their consecutive order. See if you can catch the difference. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. Let, a, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present to God as uh, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. That's the difference. Our being dead to sin comes first in logical priority. So here's what that means: since sin no longer has dominion over the Christian. They are called to flee from it. 
Since Christ has conquered the reign of sin in the heart of the saint, they are free to pursue righteousness. Brothers and sisters, to mistake the order of these two realities is the difference between death and life, law and grace, empty, vain religion, and life-giving relationship with God through Christ. Paul is alerting us to the staggering truth that our hearts have been freed from the yoke of bondage to sin through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Look at the language that he uses. You are dead to sin. It no longer reigns in you. It cannot make you obey its passions. It has no dominion over you. You, believer, are free. Free to live under grace. Free to withhold your members from sin. Free to turn from temptation. Free to reckon yourself as one who has died and been buried and raised to walk again, free to present your members for righteousness, free to serve a better master, the Lord Christ Jesus who loved you and gave himself for you. And here's why I'm burdened today. Because there are Christians here, under the sound of my voice, who are living functionally like slaves to sin. You feel imprisoned in the same struggles. You feel unable to break free of the cycle. You come to church every Sunday sin sick, wondering when you're finally going to get it behind you. And over the course of days and weeks and months and years, you've resigned yourself to a cell of sin that seems to keep you under lock and key. And this is the inadequacy of preaching. (laughs) I've got 30 minutes to convince you that you're free to beg you to believe that you're free to plead with you to hold fast to the truth of Scripture that you're free. If you are in Christ Jesus, your heart is under new management. You have been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and you have been welcomed into the kingdom of God's dear son. Your citizenship is in heaven. You are not of this world. You're free this morning. You're not a slave to sin. Let me tell you practically why it's so vital that you understand this truth. This week, some of you will find yourselves staring at a link on a screen or an empty search bar. And on the other end of that link, or the other end of that search bar, is a world of lust inducing material. And guess what? You are going to either click or not click. You're going to search or not search. This week, some of you are going to hear compromising information about a person that you don't like or lies about them. And guess what? You are either going to gossip or not gossip. 
this week, some of you are going to be gripped by anxiety that is so intense, you're going to feel like you're drowning. And you're either going to despair of God's goodness or not despair. And on and on I could go with a million examples of the snares that Satan uses to entice and entangle us. You know your struggles this morning. You know which darts he shoots at you most often. You know the sin that you would commit immediately if you learned today that it was perfectly acceptable from here on out. You know. And you're going to be confronted with those sins and those temptations a hundred times this week, a thousand times this week. If we include our thought life. And the point is, at that moment of temptation, you will have to make a choice. You have to do something. You can indulge in the sin and take advantage of God's free grace by rebelling in the face of it. Or, as an alternative, in that moment, you can call to mind the precious truth that you are dead to sin, that you are alive in Christ, and you can turn from the sin, and you can flee the temptation, and you can make Spiritual progress. Progress. That's a word that we don't pay enough attention to. After all, we Calvinists, we're grace people, right? Grace alone, we say. Or sola gratia, if we want to impress our non-reformed friends. And of course, we should be grace people. After all, we are nothing apart from God's grace. But hear me out this morning. If we're not careful, we will fall into the subtle but dangerous trap of thinking that grace erases the need for progress. We'll start to believe that our righteousness which God regards as filthy rags, continues to be only filthy rags until the day that we die. But let's not forget, brothers and sisters, that our righteousness is only filthy to the degree that we try to swap it for grace or leverage it to earn God's favor. Of course that's true. In God's economy, our works don't spin. No one can be saved by their own effort. No one can be justified by their own merit. No one can be saved apart from faith and the finished work of Christ. It's all grace all the time. But if you're a Christian, then it's also true that God poured out his grace and sent his spirit to dwell in your heart in order to sanctify you. To conform you into the image of his son from one degree of glory to the next. To shape your character and shape your thoughts and shape your actions and your reactions so that they will be more Christ-like with each passing day. Do not despise progress. Progress is the proof that a work of grace has taken place in your life, which is why the Bible routinely calls our works of obedience fruit. Because if God has planted you and you are rooted in Christ, then fruit will follow. In other words, while perfection isn't possible, progress is. Now, of course, let me hasten to say that as long as you live, sin will continue to tempt you. 
You did not need me to come here this morning and tell you that, but while I'm already up here, it will entice and discourage you. And on this side of glory, you are going to continue to fall. Some sins are going to persist longer than others. Some of them will easily beset you. But progress is possible. You can walk in the light. You can have a pure conscience. You can live in his love. You can reckon yourself as dead. You can bear fruit by his grace It's possible. So, let us read with full hearts the obituary of our old man. Let us bid him good riddance and forget where his gravestone even is. Let us be hidden with Christ and work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let us, by faith, renounce the world, the flesh, and the devil. Let us be a holy people, set apart, sanctified and let us as a church spur one another on to good works confess our faults to one another bear one another's burdens and confront one another in love by God's grace and by the Spirit's power And through the Son's sacrifice, let's make progress. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the beautiful truth of the text that we read this morning. God, we are tempted so often to take advantage of your grace, to make less of it than we ought to make. It's good and right to rely on your grace, but may we never mistake your grace as a license to do whatever act of unrighteousness we wish to do. But rather, may we understand that as Christians, our relationship to sin is not the same as it used to be. For once upon a time when we were dead in trespasses and sins and blind to your glory, we sinned in accordance with our nature, But by virtue of the work of Christ in us, you have given us a new nature which we must now sin against if we are to sin at all. May we come to terms with the fact that you have done a work in us, an irrevocable work. And though we may still struggle and be wooed and enticed by sin and temptation, You have conquered its reign in our hearts so that it no longer has dominion over us. God, I pray that we as individuals would be serious about grace. I pray that we as a church would be serious about grace. But at the same time, and with no contradiction, may we as individuals and we as a church be serious about holiness. Serious about a lifelong pursuit of strangling sin everywhere we find it, the moment that we find it. And I pray that you would bless our humble pursuits after holiness and that the fruit that we would bear of righteousness as individuals would collect and improve this church as a whole. May we be known throughout this city and throughout this area 
as those who believe in the free grace of God and believe in the powerful difference that it makes in our day-to-day life. May we be living examples of the transformative power of God's grace day after day until the time when the yoke of sin will be destroyed and cast into hell and we will enjoy your holy presence as those who have been glorified and set free once and for all from sin. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.